Welcome everybody to our task force video uh, with three leaders from the sector to discuss the report that came out at 10 o'clock last night. So I'd like to introduce Ian Thorley, who's now a care consultant, but previously was the CEO of Estia, our second largest operator in the country. Grant Corduroy, the senior partner of Stuart Brown Accountants, and Cam Ansell, Managing Director of Ansell Strategic. Welcome, gentlemen. I'd just like to open up by running through the synopsis that was in the report that was released at 10 o'clock last night, because it sets up what the um, recommendations from the task force are looking to achieve. So I'll just read through these. The task force recommendations support an aged care system that is sustainable, fair, and facilitates greater innovation. A financially sound aged care sector will attract additional investment and ensure services will be available in the future, particularly new aged care beds. The recommendations, recommendations seek quality care to be available when it is needed and is simple, more flexible and transparent. The system should enable those who wish to age in place to do so. Rules should continue to ensure equitable access of, for people with low means with co-contribution for those who have the means. Co-contribution will be required for the things people have typically paid for their whole lives, such as daily living expenses and for in residential aged care, their accommodation costs. Stronger residential care financial viability will encourage different forms of investment. In home care, the task force recommends greater clarity for participants and provides through clearly defined inclusion and exclusion principles and service lists. The government will continue to support thin markets. So that's the synopsis that uh, the uh, report had last night. I'd just like to ask uh, these leaders first up, what do you think of the report? Cam, I might go to you first. <laughs> Throw me straight in it. Thanks, Chris. Um, look, I thought the report was uh, relatively clear and, and, and nicely written. Um, and I thought the identification of, of the problem at the beginning was really good. Um, the report talks about the increase in government spending from about 1.1% to 2.5%, talks about a million consumers of aged care services becoming 2 million uh, consumers in, in a decade. And at the same time, it's projecting a, a shrinking of the taxpayer base by a little over, over 40%. So the problem is substantial. And I think that in order for this to be sustainable moving forward, we need to have a balance between consumer contribution and taxpayer contributions as the taxpayer base shrinks. Thank you for that. Grant, do you see the report going in the direction that Cam is talking about, that there is a balance, there will be a balance? Yes, I do. I think the, it's important to realise that the, the task force charter was to look at how we increase funding, the funding envelope. In that funding envelope, it touched on, we'll talk about recommendation nine, but the direct care. So Australia is quite unique really in the world where our direct care needs, our assessed direct care needs in, in residential, the taxpayer pays about 96% of it and about 4% is paid by the mean assisted care fee. And in home care, it's about 98% at the moment is paid for by the, by the government. Now that's very high by overseas standards. But putting that to one side, the clear thrust of the task force recommendations was for those expenses that we paid for all our adult lives, being everyday living, catering, cleaning, laundry, utilities, and accommodation, those should be recouped by the provider with a margin, and they're not being recouped at the moment. I think what's missing is, is, is to the detail behind it. How much is it going to cost an individual consumer? And the detail, what does this all mean? Yeah, like, it, it, what does it really mean? Will it put the sector on a sustainable footing? I think it does, and, and Stuart Brown is doing modelling to, to support that. But I think that's missing from the report. And I think the report, the charter wasn't, but we must recognise that workforce is not included in the report, nor was it the charter, but is so important about the sustainability of the sector going forward. But in summary, you're, you you like the report? Yes, if we go through the 23 recommendations, 
I don't feel there's any recommendations that were missing when we're looking at increasing the funding envelope and particularly focusing on the consumer contributions. If implemented, will the recommendations deliver sustainability? Well, maybe um, for the why well, my dad's the first, and then is that we we estimate that you know, it's going to be some. There's a phasing in period because all existing residents and recipients are going to be grandparents. They won't be growing any differently than they do today, and therefore it'll take three years before we get all the full effects. When they're implemented, it will put the sector on a more sustainable footing, remembering that aged care is a long-term investment and a long-term sustainability. So if we compare it to, say, for example, to the private health listed entities, it'll be representing return around about half of what they're getting on the stock exchange. But for a sector like aged care, I think it will put it on a sustainable footing. Cam, are you feeling the same? Uh, it's certainly, I think, that some of the initiatives are going to improve the financial performance of providers, all other things being equal. Um, we don't know. Having led SDF for a number of years and being a leader of large operators, extra cash coming in, beds are full. This must be really happy days for uh, some operators, mustn't it? Um, well, uh, it, it will be interesting to see the response over the coming days. I would imagine that there'd be uh, uh, operators and investors looking at this report this morning and feeling reasonably positive about the content. And I think the report has um, well met the mandate that it was given. And I think um, greater co-contribution is something that uh, broadly uh, in this country is is uh, well received um, by the population and particularly given the fact that we've got a superannuation system that has been very successful um, the ability for uh, the coming recipients to make this co-contribution again is probably uh, somewhat different to uh, users of the past um, so will it um, lead to a quantum change um, in confidence? Um, again, I, I say um, the detail is going to be the uh, really, really important thing. Um, this is uh, a sector where there's considerable operational risk. Um, and with operational risk, um, there has to be an appropriate return uh, on the capital deployed. And uh, I think some of the things that have come through conceptually um, will in improve the returns. Um, but investors and operators will be looking very carefully at, one, the initial uh, response by the government, um, but also um, other things that will give them confidence that there will be uh, policy stability. And uh, the role of the pricing commissioner and uh, uh, the response by governments into the future um, about the uh, um, recommendations of the pricing commissioner are going to be vital. Thank you for that. If I could move on to home care, can I ask the panel, what are the key details for home care and why? Grant, you've had opportunity to look at it and you're on the task force. So what are the key details for home care and why? Well, well the key details for home care is really about the consumer contributions. Home care is in a different circumstance than residential aged care, where the funding at the moment for the individual recipient is greater than they need. And we see this at the about 85% of the funding is actually used to provide the service delivery. And this has led to the situation where there's very low consumer contributions. So I think that this report has to be taken hand in hand in home care by reviewing the funding circumstance. We've got to change it, that the funding that's available for a, a recipient is actually used by the recipient and excess funds are then reallocated to other to other recipients rather than sitting in unspent funds. So the thrust from the home care is that yes, we should be paying for the services delivered. And it's basically having three streams, overall streams, clinical care, which effectively it's saying like residential care will have low consumer contribution, if any, 
in, in, in um, independence and safety, which is the major portion, which includes allied health and support and social support. And that's a major portion of it. And it's saying that there should be, a, in a sense, a compulsory consumer contribution for that. And when we get to everyday living, which is your cleaning and your maintenance and those sorts of areas, same, that we should have a compulsory contribution. So this is basically setting the scenes, seeds to when we move to support at home, when we're having much more direct service delivery, that we have a contribution for each of those areas, but maintaining that the, the clinical care is, is very little consumer contribution. Now, I hope this has then led to the next stage where when we make a contribution, uh, the participant or the recipient makes a contribution, that's the first amount that's used. In other words, if I'm contributing $30 a week, then that's $30 a week is the first bit that's acquitted. I actually think that that will change the nature of the relationship between the provider and the recipient, because the recipient or the participant will have more skin in the game using that term, and they'll have an expectation that that money is going to be used initially. That'll then force the provider in a nice way to increase the level of service. In simple terms, the home care recommendations say the elements that you did, you know, that you um, the services that you had prior to the entering the home care system you paid for yourself, you're going to start paying for those yourself because they're not care oriented and that's the normal function of living in your own home. Correct. Is that That's correct. So yes. things like uh, coming in and doing the washing up, cleaning the windows, mowing the garden and so on, uh, the government, the task force is recommending that the individual pay, continues to pay for those things themselves, and that will free up funding for uh, higher level care needs. Is that a fair that, summary? That, that is correct, yes. And that will change uh, a lot the, the business case for a lot of home care providers, won't it? When you, consider, so. some, mm. when you consider close to 80% of home care services are non-medical. Well, it will change the business case, and and hopefully, as I said, it's got to it's got to be directly related to the funding and the way that the care budgets are determined. And if home care providers would welcome the fact that they could use a hundred percent of their funding or close to a hundred percent of their funding for providing those home care services, and 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 including that the contribution, so I think it will actually change the business case and really move home care hopefully to the next level of professionalism yeah agree cam have you, what are your thoughts on this you have clients in the home care sector yes I, I agree i agree with with grant both for um, home care and residential aged care i think those those costs that we're used to paying for ourselves um, we need to to make sure that we can continue to do that if we have a disproportionate amount of money going towards um, daily living costs that we're used to paying for and we have the capacity to pay for, um, then we should continue with that. Obviously, as the, as the taxpayer pool shrinks and the availability of, of funding uh, declines, we've got to have more of our resources directed to where it's needed. And I think making sure that we still have the capacity within the case management system to make sure that those living costs and those living services are still being addressed, I think is, is still important. Thank you very much. Um, that does cover uh, go to the uh, the subject of new models. Uh, again, concentrating on home care. Do you foresee new models occurring with home care? Look, I think absolutely. And again, I think what we're seeing now, and the Royal Commission recommended it, is having one aged care system. You know, where people enter the aged care system, they get assessed for their care needs and then they choose where they're going to receive those aged, those care systems. The new Aged Care Act, um, I think they're grappling with how seniors housing or retirement living comes in. But I think that retirement living will in the future become more accessible for higher levels of care and care delivery. And I think that's where the new model will come in and you'll see more campus style complexes coming up where, where you've got home independent living, you might have assisted living, respite and residential, 
And I think that this will really encourage that model. And we're seeing a number of providers now without knowing them moving down that direction. And I think that's a very important direction to move to. Cam, you've got strong thoughts in this area in terms of the models that will be evolving and the role of home care supplementing the lack of aged care beds that might be available. Yes, Chris, and, and we've talked about this for, for, for a long time, but I, I, I think that in the future, uh, home care becomes the main game. It's it's not our primary focus of, of funding and support at the moment, although more people receive it, obviously. I think a higher concentration of subsidies and consumer contributions towards that area helps us delineate between those relatively hard boundaries around residential aged care, home care and retirement living. I think we'll see an amalgamation of those campuses are probably one example, but I think there's also an element of a different consumer group. And I think the natural denial that comes with us as we're aging means that it might be attractive for us to have more mainstream residential providing home care services into it. So yes, I think the new models are, are very exciting. What's an example of the, resi the residential um, models that might have e evolve that you just mentioned? Uh, so, well, I think yeah, well, I think you probably see see them in in um, uh, village operators that don't aren't co-located with residential aged care. Um, so of course you'll have ones that do operators grant says around the campus models and the Somerset um, Ryman um, Australian Unity uh, co-located uh, sites. But I think we're seeing others that are essentially residential on their own with the focus of older people either in receipt of home care packages or making user contributions or both. And you're talking about technology in the home. Tech, all, all sorts of assisted technologies um, to substitute for the um, what I believe will be um, a labour de deficit. I'm almost saying let's get the sector sustainable now before we focus too heavily on what it could look like in a full rental model. But in, in simple terms, for key details, one key detail is that the concept of part of the RAD is going to be retained, uh, the recommendation, and that would be, for easy language, that would be called rent. The yes. second is um, the you're proposing that uh, uh, a percentage would be around 3% of the RAD paid annually, capped for five years. And for the DAP, uh, that will you. I think the report recommends that uh, that be fixed, or well, there's discussion in there that the DAP be fixed at a percentage. Have I got that right? Well, certainly, I, I think the DAP should be um, fixed in a sense, fixed at a percentage, but really reflect the cost of capital, and and let Treasury finance determine what the cost of capital is, because it's effectively what it is. It's the cost of capital for accommodation. I think it should never go below eight percent. Um, and, uh, and I don't think the cost of capital, even in the low interest rate times, has ever been below 8%. So I think that should be the case. Yes, there should be a deferred rental or rental component of a RAD. I think that that equalises the two. Um, you can still flex them either way. And I think the, the, ta the task force report is pretty clear in, in those sorts of areas. And I think that will be a good change and a good good revenue flow for accommodations, we're losing up to $18 a day per bed per day on accommodation. And so this is the way of overcoming that revenue flow. So I think I think the task force report is, is clearly, and this is something as is, is I think everyone knows here, that we've been talking about together the basic daily fee uh, being deregulated, we've been talking about for three or four years. And I'm very happy from that point of view that the task force report is in a sense is actually um, agreeing with what we've been promoting for a while. So in, in simple term, terms for the audience, how many dollars in your modelling is that going to bring per bed, per aged care facility per day? Okay, so just remembering that if we just use a simple 100 bed home, using today's average 45 beds are supported or partially supported, so there's no, a comment, no RAD or DAP. Of that remaining 55%, Around about 40% are a, a DAP, 30% is a RAD, and the balance is a combination of the two. So this additional rental amount, we call it on the RAD, only affects maybe 30 
percent of the residents. We think that that will 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 increase in a sense, um, approximately ten dollars over across the board, ten dollars per bed per day. For clarity, that ten dollars per bed per day is that across the one hundred beds average, yeah, that's or is across that across? The, that's a, that, that's across the 100 beds. So basically, what the extra amount you'd receive from the retention or the re rental out over the course of the whole bed could be up to $10 per bed per day. So for those people that have been watching your charts for years and seeing that we're losing $10, $15, $20 <laughs> per day, now there, there is the possibility, if the recommendations are taken up, that they could be getting, say, $10 of that loss. Um, yeah. Taken away. Yeah, we we think that if you if you combine the three just for ease, if we get increased everyday living, you know, consumer contribution, that that differential in the in the the rad the retention, making certain we retain eight percent plus for the DAP, plus happy days if the accommodation supplement was increased to be more reflective of the cost, we think all of that's going to come up to probably close close to just over thirty dollars per bed per day. So, Cam, uh, does this mirror your thinking in terms of additional funds? And, and what, what do you think that's going to do to um, aged care operators across Australia? They're getting $25 to $30 more per bed per day. Well, I think it's a, a probably one of the biggest impacts that come out of this report. So if you just break down all the things that, that Grant said, um, you're now looking to, to increase the, the artificial that we've capped that we've, we've, we've had on, on RADs. Um, we're looking at going from MPIR interest rates to a WAC, to weighted average cost of capital, which is, you know, a, a significant increase. Um, and then you're going to add a retention. And then your RADs also will be on a derivative of WAC, and you're going to revise the, the, the value on the duration of the stay. And all of these things are increasing, certainly improving the, the viability of providers. The two things that's really critical for me, one is, there's no question that if you do that, you must go to the supplement. You must make sure that the safety net addresses those people that can't pay that significant increase in, in costs. All of these things are getting us closer to realistic returns on our investment in, in residential aged care. Um, and it's very, very critical and, and very important. It's also have has incredible flow on effects as well, because as we are required to pay more. My experience is that consumers and their families become really, really interested in this stuff. They're really interested in the daily fee, and they're really, really interested in um, retentions when we when we had them in in uh, 2012. And they do actually get quite involved in that: how much they're paying and how much um, of of the rad they're going to get back. It also then does bring into strong focus all of that additional expenditure plus some small increase in it. In, um, means tested care fees potentially is then also looking at alternatives and what are we doing here. One thing I do notice overseas is where you try to introduce retentions um, in aged care does tend to be um, met with some resistance. This one you've got it covered. If you don't want the RAD, you're going to go for the DAP. They're both both, both levying a, a whack equivalent, and hopefully we've got a safety net for those financially disadvantaged that can't afford it. But all those costs, I'm looking at it and I'm wondering, OK, what else are our options? Um, and as the modelling forecasts, we're not expecting a huge increase in investment in residential aged care bed numbers. To me, it brings into play the potential for alternatives that are also um, you know, potentially costly. Thank you for that. Ian, you've, your career has been um, running large aged care operators, what what are you thinking of the thought of $25 to $30 per bed per day increase in revenue? Well, clearly the operators would uh, see this as a very positive thing. And I think as both uh, Grant and, and Cam have described it, um, the retention from a RAD or a different uh, way of thinking about the interest rate on a DAP um, uh, you know, will be seen as um, an important thing. Um, uh, the uh, experience I've had uh, has been with companies that really have been quite agnostic about RADS, DAPs, or for that matter, um, supported and fee-paying residents. So 
Um, you know, there were some suggestions in the report that maybe, you know, the form of payment or non-supported might have, uh, you know, disadvantaged some individuals. Um, maybe it did. I'm not sure. But overall, um, I think this is uh, this is uh, an important development. Um, interestingly, the report also covers um, an alternative um, to uh, to the current accommodation system, uh, payment system, um, in 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 the future. Pam uh, touched on it in terms of uh, building new beds. Uh, the minister regularly states that there is a rising tide of uh, baby boomers and we are not prepared for them with the, with the amount of stock that we have, aged care beds that are available. Is this, uh, if the recommendations are accepted and it does bring new money into the sector, will that generate more construction? Cam, I get the feeling you don't think it will. Uh, well, I think it, on, on its own, there are some financial incentives that look quite good. Um, I think it would be good when we get the response from government, if it's pitched the way that Grant pitched it before, when we look at uh, recommendation 12, there are some in the investment and banking community that um, will be wondering, what does that mean? Grant says it's three years before we see the, um, the fun, full financial benefit of the other recommendations flow through. The other thing is Ian's comments, which is the availability of humans to staff residential aged care and home care into the future. And I think that's where some of your investment decisions come as well. Yes, there's a huge number of uh, older people coming into the system with us, um, but there's less people than the generations to follow to actually provide the resources to, to run those services. So you've got to balance it up. The financial performance um, is, is important, but our ability to be able to run these things with some pretty draconian um, staff mandates at the moment probably doesn't make it as exciting. I think we'll probably see more investment in uh, substitute models. Yeah, I think, I think Chris, um, that you're right, there's two different terms of sustainability. By 2027, we have it's very sustainable based on the current system, which includes RADs, and that by 2030, it's looking at Will it be sustainable enough to support a rental system five years after that date? In other words, it's two different levels of sustainability. Noting that with the possible exception of the retirement living, which has got a form of it, RADs are unique to aged care and certainly unique to residential aged care anywhere in the world. So, but I think it's that looking at that sustainability to move to a rental system by 2035. And, and, yeah, I think that's. I think that timeline is good, but I probably share Cam's view that at the moment I would I'd see it sustainable on the current system, but whether sustainable to move and sustainability is really not just the surplus of the profits, but whether the financial institutions are ready to are ready to lend, knowing that the payback period could be ten or fifteen years if you're if you're building a new place. And that's that's that sustainability, the question that's going to be looked at at 2030 to 2035. It doesn't mean that we're thinking that it's going to take to 2030 for the current sector to be sustainable. Yeah, and that's not how the banks fund at the moment. So they generally take a long-term position. They get their, they provide for the development and then they get most of their exposure dealt with with the with the RAD inflow on the new on the new rack. If we could uh, round off the conversation, um, gentlemen, do you have confidence that the co-contribution will be delivered by government? And if so, when? You know this, Grant. <laughs> um, okay, well, I, I can't speak for government, but I'd like to think that both the government and the opposition recognise that this is not only required, but once we educate the public and do it properly, we remember we had a big change in 2014 when we went to all people entering aged care had to pay a RAD rather than an accommodation bond hostel low care. Now that went through without too much too much change. Then we talked about RADs in 2014 going to six adapts based on 6.95%. That went through without too much change. So I think the fear, my fear, 
is that if we confuse this with cost of living, because at the moment it's clear we've got a cost of living concern, deep concern with many of the community. And if we then, the report comes out, say we want more consumer contribution, it can be argued, well, gee, we've got a problem with cost of living today. How can we do this? I think we've got to make it clear that the only people to be affected by those are the elderly people who are receiving aged care services. It won't affect anyone in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, et cetera, if you're not receiving aged care services. So we don't conf conflate the two. If we can keep that going, then I'm confident that, I'm confident that this will get bipartisan support. Yeah. Uh, yes, look, I think this is a relatively safe report. They they set things up relatively well with the National Care and Support Economy Strategy at the end of last year, so we knew all the concepts that we've been talking about today. Um, and I think they've probably had enough time to contemplate this report in, in, in the lead up to its release last night. So um, I, I think they'll get through uh, I still think that, uh, and that there are some positives for providers, as we've said. Um, they've not addressed the elephant in the room, which is means tested care fees. It's that part that will make this unsustainable for our kids. Um, at some point between now and the next 10 years, someone's going to have to confront that, that elephant. But I don't think they've offended enough people in this for this not to be carried. Ian, your thoughts? Chris. Clarity around the safety net and uh, the equity um, of uh, how the safety net will be applied um, is absolutely critical. And I do believe that by and large, the community um, has um, an overall sense that where one has the capacity to contribute to services that we consume, um, you know, they do so. and. Uh, and uh, I think it will be the same with this report. Well, thank you very much. We can feel very, um, I think we can feel positive for the future.